questions of doom. Hello and welcome back to another questions of doom. In this series, as ever, I attempt to answer questions that you send my way using the archaeosoup at gmail.com email address, as displayed on the YouTube channel homepage, but as you'll also see at the end of this video. In answering these questions by video, it is my fond hope that the answer is not only useful to the person who's asked the question, but also anyone else out there who may be wondering the same thing. Now, today's question comes all the way from Austria, and from a moment of inspiration. It goes as follows. Dear Archeosoup, how plausible do you think it is that swords in burials were bent not to fit into the situla or to avoid reuse by grave robbers, as I often read in German literature about this subject, but rather to allow the deceased person to take the now killed sword with him or her uh, into the other world or into the world of the dead, into the afterlife? A straight working sword could have been seen as a living object, which had to be killed or bent to allow the deceased to take it with them. Uh, this is according to my thesis, which I came up with while sitting on the loo. True, apparently. Mm. I'm obviously by no means an expert, and I don't know if my theory already exists, or indeed was possibly proven wrong a long time ago. I just never read about it before. Kind regards from Austria, Christian Unterberger. Uh, Unterberger, perhaps. Now, Unterberger, I might be wrong, but does that mean Underhill? Underhill, as in a hobbit surname. How cool is that? Um, thank you very much, Christian, for your question. This is a very interesting question. Uh, and there is, in fact, a very short and precise answer to it. Uh, I'll give you the short answer, first of all, and that is yes. Yep. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, th this is one of the many ideas that surround the phenomenon of, of in particular, bending weapons in, in the grave. Uh, but what I want to do with this answer, actually, is just sort of look at a couple of examples and also some related uh, phenomena which we observe in the archaeological record. Um, there are various interpretations though for, for the bending of swords in particular and um, I'll touch on those uh, in, in, this, in this answer video. So yeah, basically I, c I could go on, go, go on about this for a long time. There's lots of, there's lots of examples th from throughout human history but I'm going to just focus on a couple. Um, so really, the Iron Age, that's really what we're talking about. It's that sort of what many people would call Celtic world, uh, pre-Roman Iron Age Europe. Um, there's actually a great paper from 2011, which I happen to have found an online version of. I'll put a link into the description below, uh, which actually describes uh, similar phenomena in the Iron Age, uh, from Transylvania up through sort of Eastern Europe, Germany, I think Poland might be mentioned, um, and it also touches on it, it, it touches on how this also goes into the Roman world as well a little bit, uh, and posits some potential reasons for the bending of swords. There's actually some really lovely diagrams in this particular paper. Um, one of the reasons potentially for bending a sword, in particular a sword in, in a grave, is because it's just too long. <laughs> Perhaps the uh, the ditch the, the, or the, the the ditch the grave which has been dug the cut which has been dug isn't uh, isn't the right size or shape for a sword um, and therefore they bend it in order to make it fit. This, for me at least, is the least plausible. It may be in one or two particular occasions where maybe they were digging a grave in rock, maybe, but. Typically, people who are digging graves know who they're digging the grave for and what is going to go into it. So I don't, I don't think actually because the weapon's too long is a good reason. Um, another potential explanation is, as you've touched on in your question, to deter robbers, uh, to, especially if, if someone's very famous. If you're burying, uh, as say, a famous chieftain or warrior, and you very publicly, dramatically bend their prized weapon, just sort of in front of everyone, then it's there for the world to see. Everyone can see that's now beyond use, uh, certainly beyond use as a, as, a, as, a, you know, as a weapon, as a useful item, uh, beyond its raw material value. And therefore you might deter some of the people who will be milling around in the crowds uh, from maybe coming back later that day, or maybe even later that year, and taking the sword out of the grave. 
There are other interpretations though, and these vary greatly. Uh, these are all just ideas really because they, because they can't be completely confirmed. But basically they're, mis they're sort of mysterious or mystical or uh, religious in their nature. Uh, uh, maybe the sword, for example, has a personality. Maybe the sword, is it because it's, it's been given a name, has, has its very own being which has to be killed when the warrior has died. Um, perhaps the sword has a soul. Perhaps the sword is in fact seen as an extension of a warrior's body and when the warrior dies uh, the, the warrior's extended arm therefore must also die uh, too. All of these are deeply possible and uh, it seems more likely than not that the bending of an item, especially a sword, is extraordinarily replete with symbolism because these, these weapons take a lot of effort to make and therefore destroying one is kind of like blowing up a Ferrari, you know? Um, if someone blew up a Ferrari at a funeral that's making a statement and the same goes for bending a sword. Um, we know that in some cases, for example, amongst the Vikings, certain rich uh, chieftains or kings would in fact have uh, have weaponry destroyed with them. In particular, again, swords, because again, swords often have names and they're often very important. So yes, in other words, yes, it's entirely possible and it is a very widely held theory and belief that the bending of swords or weapons throughout time is to do with, with the fact that they were living and that they needed to be killed in order to be useful for the dead person. Uh, that said though, and this, this is where we move on in the discussion, uh, you really shouldn't dismiss the power and the intention, of especially, especially a very dramatic burial, um, the intention that it is to be observed and taken in by the viewers, by the living people around the grave. Uh, there's an example which, which is one of my favourites, which actually I, I pointed out in an In Focus video a couple of years ago. Um, I think the video was called Don't no, so you fake it till they excavate it, that's it. It was in Borum, uh, in eastern Denmark, in the Bronze Age, where an oak coffin had been uh, had been put in the ground. In fact, you know, it, was a, it was a cemetery. And in this oak coffin, there was a, a person buried with a sword scabbard, and in the sword scabbard was a dagger, not a sword. Uh, and this was presumably to give everyone watching the impression that, oh, 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 they're burying a sword. Blimey, they must, they must have loads of money. It was, um, it was, a, it was an act of, uh, of theatre for the people observing. But clearly the family didn't really want to actually bury a sword, so they put a dagger in, this, in this, the sheath instead. Now, it could have been a, sim a symbol of a sword. It could have been entirely... Um, um, entirely uh, uh, symbolic act, but more likely than not, um, because they didn't want to lose face in their community, that's what went into the scab of the dagger and not a sword. Uh, so so the, this sort of adds credence to that notion that actually the bending of a sword is a public act. It is, a, it is, a, it is an act which, uh, which, will be, which is intended to be observed and which will carry with it um, a resonant uh, message. That said though, there's also the possibility that, that the destruction of something could in fact represent, I suppose, the life cut short. Uh, in this, this instance, I'm actually thinking about um, Mesolithic burials in prehistory, the, in the Erteborl culture, uh, again in Denmark. There's a place called Vedbeek, um, which is a, a cemetery where very famously there was an infant buried with a swan's wing. And um, I pointed to this in the past um, as an example of where, where it's clear that, that children were valued in that community, uh, or certainly the potential of the child was valued. But actually, more explicitly, he was buried with uh, a, um, a, a, a flint knife which had actually deliberately been snapped and then put into the grave. And this, this is resonant of, again, these are, these are interpretations, these aren't absolute facts, we don't know for sure. But this is resonant of the same sort of stuff that you see, say, in Victorian graveyards, where there's a pillar which is um, above someone's grave, which has been carved to look as though it's been snapped. Uh, and maybe it's, it's got some carved ivy on it, this kind of thing. It's, it's telling you, this person died far too young. And maybe the destruction of something that goes into the grave is 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 reminding everyone watching that actually um, maybe this person shouldn't shouldn't have gone there um, when they did, perhaps perhaps. Now there's also another possibility, and that is that the destruction of an item simply renders it not only. Um, 
useless to human hands, but also in some way beyond the, the realm of humanity. Not necessarily for the use of the dead, but maybe perhaps for the use, for example, of the gods. Um, there's a, there's, a, there's a site in France, in the Somme, uh, called uh, Grenet sur Aronde. Um, I'll put the name below. There's actually an example where there's a, the, it seems that, that there's some sort of rite of passage occurring, where um, various uh, weapons, in, again in particular swords, have been deposited uh, and are actually in fact bent. The site was, it seems, a Gallic... Um, a, 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 a temple, I suppose, which then later on was built on by the Romans. So this site was important before the Romans arrived and continued to be important afterwards. But these were actually objects which were being destroyed so that not only could people not use them, but that they could actually transition into being for the gods. They were votive offerings for, for the gods. Now this is potentially even more explicit in sites, uh, one which comes to mind is in North Wales. Uh, for example, uh, Llyn Kerigbach in Anglesey is in fact uh, a site where various objects were deposited into the lake uh, and in particular swords were bent and this was almost certainly uh, an explicit votive offering, destroying the object for the use of mankind, putting it into the water away from mankind with the hope that the gods would accept it. That said though, the destruction of an artifact for the gods isn't necessarily entirely universal. There's another lake in Wales, uh, Llyn Vaur, where um, a Bronze Age hoard, a late Bronze Age hoard was discovered, where things like cauldrons, I think spearheads, certainly swords, were, were deposited into the lake for the gods, uh, and this is sort of you know, running into the Iron Age, kind of approaching that time. Uh, and these artifacts have been brought from across Europe, I think from like Halster and this kind of area. Uh, but they weren't destroyed, they weren't bent, they were just deposited in the lake. So maybe actually bending a sword became something associated with the gods when it hadn't been previously. And perhaps the bending of the sword is more rightly thought of as being a practice reserved for burial, for chieftains, or for people who, who owned important artifacts. That said though, it is worthwhile remembering that these votive depositions, uh, these offerings to the gods, are not the same as burial. And maybe we shouldn't be too quick to draw a direct connection between destruction of a weapon in a votive offering and the destruction of a weapon in a grave uh, deposition. Uh, perhaps there are similar thought processes, similar cultural associations with these items, which lead to them requiring killing or destruction before they are laid down. But perhaps the, the, the exact reason as to why you destroy a sword for the gods and why you destroy a sword that was owned by someone, um, perhaps those reasons are in fact slightly different. So we shouldn't be too quick to draw a connection. What is clear though is that in both cases these, these items are being removed from easy use by the living. They're being removed in some ways from the from the realm of the living. Uh, and that, that, that is a clear, a clear similarity, I suppose. It's also finally worthwhile remembering the power of destroying something in, in a broader context, and also actually what that means. There's a very strong uh, series of ideas around the fragmentation of things in archaeology. I'm uh, thinking here, I suppose, more of snapping, say, flint blades or pottery, or, or, um, or actually even jewellery, other things, uh, rather than just bending swords. Uh, my dissert dissertation supervisor, John Chapman, actually has some very interesting ideas surrounding uh, the fact that, that when something is broken, not only is there the act of breaking and there's the meaning of the break, uh, but also the fact that, that the broken pieces take on a life of their own. You can actually take them away and you're forever linked with the other people who have a piece of this thing. Uh, and perhaps in, in destroying something, people are able to, if not literally, then certainly um, f emotionally share in the moment of destruction. So this once again brings us back to that notion that again the act is for the observers. Whether it is to stop them stealing the thing, whether it is to underline the death of a warrior or a chieftain and the, the loss of their the, of the extension of their arm, whether it is simply to, to say to everyone, you all here bear witness, we are destroying this man's sword, this or this woman's sword, we are destroying this important artifact, <laughs> here you go. 
you know, let no, none of you forget this, this act. Uh, perhaps that is uh, as much as we ought to dare uh, try and say about the, this, this phenomenon which we do observe, especially in Iron Age graves. So hopefully this has been a useful answer for you, Christian, um, and hopefully actually it's given you some other things to think about and to consider when you're on the loo. Um, it's a good place to think, I think, definitely, absolutely. But anyway, <laughs> um, th 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 there are some very complex ideas and also complex discussions surrounding, uh, especially the destruction of things, uh, and in particular, the destruction of significant objects linked with burials. There's so, there's so many layers of potential symbolism there that that we could talk about this for days quite literally but hopefully i've given you given you enough to, to sort of to go on there to think about to mull over and to go away and, uh, and maybe maybe do a bit more um research and reading of your own uh, if anyone else out there has any thoughts or comments please do comment below i'd love to hear what you think about this topic especially if you've done some research of your own on this topic uh, and i'm sure christian would also like to read those comments too uh, well, guys, that's it. Um, again, thank you so much, Christian, for the question. And as ever, until next time, do take care. Bye-bye.